Acts 28 and 20, for this cause, therefore I have called you to see you. Yes. I speak with you for the hope of Israel, am I bound with this chain? Yes, yes. Throughout the letters and writing of Paul, we are encountering a word over and over again. Yes. The word chain. Yes. Paul is proud of these chains. Yes. In the writing, Paul often mentions his chains. In Acts 26, speaking before Herod Agrippa the second, Paul says, I would to God that thou, not only thou, but all those that hear me this day were both almost and all together as I am, except these chains. In his letter to the Ephesians, he begins the third chapter. Hallelujah. He says, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, in 6 and 20, he vows that I am an ambassador in change. Yes. In the letter to the Philippians, he writes, Even as it is meet for me to think, for me to think of you, because I, I have you in my heart in as much, both in my change and in the, the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Yes. You are all partakers of my grace. Yes. And then in the 12th verse, he begins the great treatise about his change. Yes. I would have you understand, brethren, that think about his change. I would have you understand, brethren, that these things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Yeah. Paul is telling us in this word that, that the chains are a furtherance and not a hindrance. Yeah. So that my chains in Christ are manifest in all the palaces in all places. Many of the brethren of the Lord are waxing confident seeing my chains. Yeah. And they are now much more bold to speak the word without fear. Yeah. One preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction. But I'm glad that in every way, in every manner, yeah. Christ is preached. Yeah. Colossians 4, he said, with all praying for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, that we might speak the mystery of Christ. For the same cause I am in chains. Yeah. The salutation by the hand of Paul, remember my chains. Philemon, he said, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. Yeah. And later he avows, I beseech ye thee, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, yeah. whom I have begotten in my chains, yeah. whom I have retained with me, yeah. that in thy stead he might have ministered to me in the bonds of the gospel. Yeah. I want you to know the change does not prevent you from being fruitful. Yeah. One of Christ, Paul's most famous and most faithful of a disciple was begotten while his hands were still in chains. Yeah. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. And he was not ashamed of my chain. When he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently until he found me. And the Lord grant him that he might find mercy in the Lord in the day. Apparently, Onesiphorus lost his life because it is open and avowed, is open and avowed friendship with Paul. And anybody here that's going to love a preacher, you're going to get in trouble. Anybody here that make up your mind to be linked tightly with the preacher, remember the preacher is always a preacher in chains. He's a preacher of the Lord. Yeah. Well, I want y'all to come on and go with me. Yeah. Well, Paul was chained to a soldier. Yeah. One by one of the Lord. Yeah. Well, I want y'all to come on and go with me. Yeah. Well, Paul was chained to a soldier. Yeah. One by one, he was chained to the Romans who guarded him. Yeah. Within a 24-hour period, three different guards were chained to the apostles. One every eight hours. I can imagine Paul speaking to these soldiers. I can picture their fascination as they listen to this small, puny prisoner as they begin to speak of Christ and of righteousness and reason of judgment to come. I looked upon them now in my mindset as they begin to examine this great, gnarled preacher and all he had to test for all of his preaching for all of his suffering, for all of his life, is nothing but change. I can see Paul as he is in Philippi. His back bleeding, beaten nearly to the life inch of his life. 
His feet now set in stocks and he's thrown into the bottom of the dungeon. But at midnight he's crying and praying. Chains ought not stop your joy. Chains ought not stop your love. I don't care how bad you're being mistreated. Even though your hands are chained, your heart ought to be set free. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And they sang until the chain fell off. And the prison door came open. And the jailer would have killed himself. But Paul said, brother, do yourself no harm. God help me this morning. God help me this morning. This praetorian God was the elite of Roman soldiery. Anyone could belong to the Roman army. A Greek, a Gaul, a Scythian, a Macedonian. Most anybody could belong to the army. But only those who had been tested, who had been tried and found to be real could be made praetorian God. Praetorian God could only belong to those who had become real citizens of Rome. Yes. But this was the personal bodyguard of the emperor. Yes. These were the private militia, the military corps that protected the body of Caesar, the most powerful person on earth. Yes. One by one, these gods were chained to Paul. Yes. Hello, somebody. Yes. Paul had appealed to Rome and to the emperor. He must go. And he came to Rome in a way that he thought not. But he didn't argue about his imprisonment, for there were many things forgotten through imprisonment. He never would have wrote some things had he not been in prison. In prison is where he wrote Ephesians. Prison is where he wrote Philippians. Prison is where he wrote Colossians and Philemon. And finally, 2 Timothy. There are vivifying and life-giving truths found in these books like they are found in no others. In Corinth, Paul is petty arguing with those that would attest his apostleship. Yeah. But in Ephesians, he leaves earth on the, he leaves life on earth. Yeah. He leaves the wrath of his enemies and the argumentation of those who would refute his word. And he begins to journey upward into the heavenlies and begin to teach us of the unsearchable manifold wisdom of Christ. He begins to see the soldier of God arrayed with the full arm of God. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, his girdles wrapped around with truth, his feet shod with the gospel of peace. In his hand the sword of the spirit, over his arm is the canopy and shield of faith. And with all praying in all regions, in all climes, in all situations, in all things, praying that God would protect him. Hello, somebody. He sees fiery darts being squinched, and he sees this soldier invincible in the might of God. And having done all to stand, he's standing impregnable because God is standing on his right and on his left. We need the fresh word of Ephesians. Many great things are happening when saints of God are cast in prison. These chains are not a hindrance, they're furtherings. Hello, somebody. Well, we got to understand that God often gives us handicaps. A handicap is a compliment in many areas. An athlete, to prove he is superior, is given a handicap. When you have a racer that's out of the ordinary, when he's faster than the common lot, and when other men would race against him, he races with them under handicap. They draw him back from the start and set him back another distance that he might give others a fair chance. He races under handicap. When a man is playing golf and his, and his abilities become superior to his competitors, he is known to play under handicap. And the better you play, the more the handicap. I wish I had someone to help with me. Oh, you look at it as the reverse. You say, because I'm a bad player, I get a handicap. But really, the actual truth of it is, the better you play, the more handicap they put on you. They award points. Y'all ain't saying nothing. They, they give you strokes, and they take all strokes on the fella that can't play. Because your talent and your ability is superior to him. Y'all not saying nothing. When you bowl, you bowl under handicap. I wish y'all would hear me. The greatest of all human verse, which is called poetry, 
Poetry is syntax that, that must be prescribed unto meter and it must be under the form of rhyme. Yet the most inspiring of all written word is poetry. And poetry is word wrote under handicap. We've got to learn that God gives us handicap that it might promote us. Handicap is a sign of growth. Handicap is a sign that you're going to a higher dimension. When God puts us on a detour, we ought to know that God have attested our apostleship. If everything is going well with you, then you're not on the right side. Some people are so worthless to the devil, he don't ever bother them. Now, I would not have you know, brethren, I would have you know, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have been hindrance, I mean, have been furtherance and not hindrance. The things which have happened unto me. Here we read, I would have you understand. The things which happened unto me have fallen out. Hello, somebody. What happened? Well, let's begin in Acts 21. What happened starts there. The apostle sets foot in Jerusalem, and he's forewarned by the Holy Ghost that chains and imprisonment are waiting on him. In the 28th verse, an entirely false accusation is leveled upon him by his own countrymen. In the 22nd chapter, he is nearly lynched by a religious mob. And he winds up in a Philippian prison. Next, he goes on and he escapes flogging only by pleading citizenship. His whole case is beset by a mockery of justice. When he have all right and righteousness on his side, he cannot even secure a hearing in man's court. But he's made the subject of unjust and unprovoked insults. He is shamed and humiliated publicly by the high priest and slapped in the mouth. In the 24th chapter, he is maliciously misrepresented. They take his word and put an improper construction on them. They turn his truth into lies and make him a deadly enemy of all that Israel calls righteous and sacred. The things which have happened unto me. That was not all. There was an ungodly group that had bound themselves in an unholy plot to kill him. They had made a pledge with among themselves that they would neither eat nor drink until his life was no longer in his body. But he kept on going on. The things that have happened to me. He was kept in prison because it was popular to keep him in jail. He was kept in prison because his enemies paid to keep him in jail. And the people who officially represented the law took a bribe. He was kept in prison on trumped up charges. These are the things that Paul said have happened to me. But his suffering is not over. For not only is he imprisoned by bars and fettered in iron and kept in dungeons, but he's also chained to the brute bestiality of man. He's kept in prison on boat and he's cast adrift in a roaring, senseless, raging sea. Yes, he suffers not only on land, but he suffers adrift. He suffers not only among his kinfolk, but he suffers the falsehood of those who don't even know him. He not only suffers in day, but he suffers by night. But all of these are the portfolio of the things which have happened unto me. He's lying outside in a storm now, and he's out to sea where his life hangs as a thunder thread because of the crash of the waves. I can see the boat overloaded with corn on its way to feed the starving masses in Rome and Paul bound to the militia. Paul, before they embarked, he told the captain that I don't think we ought to sail now. This is the wrong weather. 
and the captain was so smart and so important he wouldn't take a preacher's advice. He pulled out his naval charts and his weather forecast and put Paul back in his place and let him know you worry about preaching and I worry about saving. It wasn't too many days later when the storm met him in the midst of the sea. And the Lord would have capsized the vessel. Paul lay all night long fast asleep while the soldiers were busy unloading and lightening the ship. They took a rope and bound it all the way around the ship to try to hold the fragile vessel together. And Paul was 14 nights imprisoned in the deep. Y'all ain't saying that. It's bad enough to be in prison for what you did, but it's worse to be in prison for what somebody else. It's bad enough to be in trouble over your stupidity, but nothing worse than being in trouble because somebody else was stupid. Well, I don't hear nobody. But that night, Paul, as he lay in his sleep, received a divine visitor. An angel was at the foot of his bed. No wonder the song said, by day, by night. The angels were encamping about me, my Lord. Listen, this Paul had a conversation with the angel. And the angel said, Paul, I want to tell you something. The Lord sent me here to tell you to fear not. I know you're in chains. I know if this boat go down, you're going to drown anyway because you can't swim. Not with all these chains on. It's going to be impossible for you to live. But Paul, fear not. The Lord have given you your life. I want you to know, Paul, that it's not the Roman that's holding the end of this chain. God's got the end of your chain. Yes, yes, yes. And you are not a prisoner of man, but you're a prisoner of God. Paul, and because the Lord wants you alive, he's going to keep those alive who are on board here with you. The Lord have heard your prayers and given unto you the lives of all those who sail with you. My God, I could drop down right there. How so many of the unrighteous are kept alive because of the prayers of the saints. So many of the people that are around us that know not where their benefit come from, but because of your kindness and your love and your allegiance to some true man of God, God is preserving your life. I thank God that God not only gives us our life, but he gives us the lives of those who sail with us. You better stay on the ship. For except you are pride in the ship, how will in no wise be saved? God help me. God help me. And eventually he reached Rome. Eventually he got there. But he didn't get there like he thought. But he came in the company of the condemned. He came a prisoner of Nero. He came chained to the Roman legionnaires by fetters chained in disgrace and he dragged two years out under house arrest awaiting the verdict of seas hello somebody but nevertheless still chained nevertheless still bound nevertheless still fettered nevertheless still under arrest the thing that have happened to me have not been a hindrance but have been a furtherance of the gospel somehow God is in this thing yeah well feel like preaching now suffering has a purpose suffering is of different kinds it's different types because there's a different purpose to be served by all of it God uses suffering God purposes that suffering should come into our lives somebody need to hear me now God did you hear me? God permits the things to happen to us no sense in arguing, chaffing at the bit. No sense in shaking your fist at heaven. God has allowed the things to happen unto us. If you're under a yoke of care, if you are surrounded by enemies, if you are bound and fettered by things you want to be, don't want to be bound to, remember God has allowed these things to happen unto you. 
and these things are not meant to hinder but these things are meant to make you go forward I God my God whatever happens go forward no matter what you meet with somehow you gotta go forward no matter what comes on you you can't let it snow you under but somehow some way you gotta rise above it and go forward God help me Raise your hand and say, these chains are not a hindrance, but a furtherance. I got so much to say. I've got so much. I've got so much to say. The furtherance of the gospel. That's all Paul cared for. And since that was all he cared for, he interpreted his whole life yeah. by that concept. Yeah. I want to see if my life is worth anything. It's not what happened to me that counts. Is that half of things happened to me cause the gospel to go forward. Yeah. That's all I'm caring about. Yeah. If I live, I live unto the Lord. Yeah. If I die, I die unto the Lord whether I live or die I am from the awful riot in the temple court where the Jews of Asia led by Alexander the coppersmith laid hold on Paul and dragged him bodily dragged him bodily out of the temple because they thought he introduced, they thought he introduced Trophimus, a known Ephesian Gentile, into a courtyard reserved only for Jews. They dragged him down the steps, furiously beating him to the end of his life, with the intent on murdering him when they reached the bottom. All of a sudden, in the midst of the things that are happening to him, Paul sees the hand of God. That's what makes us keep going forward. That in the midst of our trials, in the, in the midst of our suffering, we can see the discernible hand of God. Touch your neighbor and say, God's got it all in control. Yes, they were beating him. Yes, he was almost to the last step. Paul could count how many more steps his life would last. For at the bottom step, they would finish killing him. The only reason why they hadn't killed him yet, it was against the law to kill him in the temple. So they beat him to death, and at the bottom, they was going to kill him. But the Lord, all of a sudden, got in the mind of Lysias, the Roman procurator. Lysias gathered up all of his army and rushed in, pushed men aside, and put Saul on Paul on the shoulders and took shields and used them as battering rams and began to carry him from the clutches of the enemy. You knocked me down, but God picks me up and sticks right by me when the coin gets tough and I've got shields. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. It's been a furtherance. They thought they were killing me. But they've helped me to go forward. They thought that I was going to be done with. That my life would be over. But God has intercepted me. And he carried me to another city. To another pulpit. To another ministry. To another crowd. To another people. And here I'm preaching Christ. And I don't care what happens to me. As long as God is getting the glory out of my life. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Well. Well. God help me. God help me. God help me. 
Mm. The things happened to Paul were well, not only in the temple, but things happened to him in court. Paul was dragged before Felix, the governor of Judea. And on often and repeated occasions, he stood before him. But Paul was not interested in defending himself. He was interested in preaching Christ. You know we get a lot farther if when we're dragged before when we're dragged before the folks we quit defending ourselves and start preaching Christ. Paul was not interested in making himself seem right. For it mattered not to this man whether he was right or wrong. For if he lived, he lived unto the law. What mattered to Paul was that Christ be preached. So everything was looked upon as a new opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. I know you got me on trial, but let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here because there's a man from Galilee. If you in trouble, he'll set you free. Do you know him? Do you know him? Call to help me this morning. Hallelujah. So as he began to preach to Felix, you can't help preaching without meddling. If y'all just calm down, it's going to be all right. You don't have to get excited. Everything will be all right. Keep your eyes on me and everything going to be all right. And I want all you bystanders to just sit, sit down. It's going to be all right. Hallelujah. We need a praying church. If your prayer is going to be all right. Listen now. You can't start preaching God's word without meddling. Felix, he was sitting up here with his brother's wife. He had murdered somebody to have her. And Paul began to deal with him about his marriage. Some people don't want the preacher to mess with nothing about your private life. You want to do anything in your marriage and still be all right with God. But you can't do everything in your private life and be all right with God. If you're going to be a preacher, you got to preach the truth to everybody. Sometimes it means standing on people's toes. Sometimes it means touching things they don't want to touch. Sometimes you'll wind up in jail like John the Baptist. But you got to cry loud and stand out. Yes, be not afraid of their faces. For behold, I've sent you. I'm God behind you. Tell my people what thus said the Lord. And Paul began to deal with Felix about his own sins. You cannot preach the gospel without dealing with men's hearts. The gospel will find you out. It'll interrupt your life. It'll uncover your wrong. It'll expose your sin. You got to repent and say what must I do to be saved? Lift your hand and cry yeah. Paul so dealt with Felix about righteousness, temperance, and self-control, and the judgment that was to come. He so talked to Felix and the woman who he lived in adultery with. Felix trembled. It wasn't the prisoner trembling, but Felix trembled. The preacher was in chains, but he talked to him in the word of God until the judge was trembling in the seat and said, Thou almost persuaded me. My God, my God, thou almost persuaded me. What a shame to be recorded in the Bible 
to be almost persuaded to leave your sins so many days I preach to men about their problems and they're almost persuaded but they don't want to sell out and come on the Lord's side they got some precious sin that they don't want to give up but I don't care what it is it's not worth losing your soul I don't care what you're wrapped up in it's not worth your soul I'd give up anything to follow up Jesus your Lord one day one day Lord I gave up all to follow you yes he began to talk to Felix and Felix trembled under God's word I don't care who you are you can walk around right until you pop into God's word but God's word knocking the foundation out from under your feet you got to just get right and you don't get right yet until you get right with God yes almost almost is not enough you got to be fully persuaded you got to be fully convicted you got to be fully changed you got to come on the Lord's side and stay make up your mind that this is God's word and for God I live and for God I'll die lift your hand and shout yes yes Felix couldn't handle him. He was in change, but he was powerful in change. So Felix sent for Festus. He died in disgrace, removed from office. My God, I should take a lot of time here. Talk about how Paul tried to save him. Had he listened to Paul, he wouldn't have died in disgrace. But he wouldn't listen to Paul. He wouldn't repent of his sins. So a few days later, he was snatched from office. And Nero beheaded him because of the unfitness, malfeasance of his life. My God, my God. I'm preaching to men and women. It's time for you to make a change. And if you don't make a change, God is wetting his sword. You don't know what wet means. The word wet means sharpen. God has got his sword dipped in oil and he's running it over the wheel, sharpening it for the day of judgment, sharpening it to destroy the wicked, sharpening it for the unconverted mind and the unbent sinner, sharpening in it because he's waiting on you long enough. God has wetted his sword and he's drawn it back. Vengeance is mine. It's time for us to straighten up while we got a chance. Yes. The day of the Lord shall come. That's why I got saved. That's why I came clean. I confessed my sins. I didn't hide nothing. I didn't cover up nothing. I bared my heart and told God the truth. I'm in trouble. Do something for me. That's why it's all right. If you repent now, God will settle it forever. I got to rush on here. I've got to go on a little further. Let me talk about our handicapped. Paul began to preach. Hello, somebody. He began to preach. But he was in change. Amen, Ella Bowen. He was in chain. The chain was something he was conscious of. In fact, he lifted it up even as he spoke. These chains is the often repeated expression by this great apostle. He refers over and over again to his bondage and the chains which kept him there. He was a Roman prison. He was a Roman citizen. But he was only a citizen so much as to be kept in jail. He had a great indignity of being in change. 
Now I'm about to give someone a precious truth and I'm going to end the sermon. Paul had a great indignity for wearing the chain. Yet he rejoiced to wear it. I don't care what he did. I don't care how many miracles he wrought. For God confirmed his ministry was signed following. Everywhere Paul went, you could see the miraculous power of God. But as soon as Paul walked into an assembly, his chain spoke louder than his voice. He felt obliged to explain why I must preach to you in chain. His reputation went before him. And no matter where he went, people looked narrowly at this apostle whom the whole world was talking about. For this was the man that exceedingly troubled Philippi. He created no small stir in Ephesus. And he was known as the preacher that turned the world upside down. I wish I had someone to pray with me. Paul begins to talk about his chain. He said, well, I want you to know that, that uh, I would not have you ignorant. Now you are full and you are rich and you reign as kings. But I'm not able to reign with you for I'm bound with chains. I thank God have set forth the apostles last. You were appointed for life, but we have been appointed to death. We've been made a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are smart. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but I'm despised. Even unto this present hour, I'm made to hunger and thirst. I'm naked and I'm buffeted and I have no certain dwelling place. I must labor working with my own hands. I'm being reviled, yet I must bless. I'm persecuted and I must suffer it. I'm defamed, yet I entreat. I'm counted as the filth of the world. I'm known as the offscourging of all things unto this day. Hello, somebody. He said, I have a treasure in an earthen vessel. But the power is not of me, the power is of God. I'm troubled on every side, yet not distressed. I'm perplexed, but not in despair. I'm persecuted, but not forsaken. I'm cast down, but not destroyed. He goes on to say, I can give no offense in anything, because I can't have the ministry blamed. But in all things, approving myself a minister of God. Impatience, a minister of God. Yes, I've got chains on, so I've got to show patience in my chain. In many afflictions, in necessities and distresses, in stripes and in many types of imprisonments, in confusion and turmoils, in labors and watchings, in fasting, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the arm of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and by dishonor, by evil port and good report, as deceivers yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying but behold we live, as chessing yet not kill, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making others rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. Look at Paul talking about his chain. I wonder whether you'll pray with me. He speaks with carefulness, yet with deepest of conviction. For he knows that the eyes of unbelieving Jews are upon him. No matter how eloquent his speech, no matter how learned his theology, no matter how provocative his message, he was still in chain. I don't care how mightily God worked in him. I don't care how many were healed and how many lives were blessed. He was still in chain. I 
don't care what wonderful things he spoke. And he spoke the mysteries of God. But he was still in chain. There was a great unbelief that gripped the eyes of those who listened to him. And I don't care what you do and who you are, there's an unbelief of this generation. I don't care what you say, folk are not going to be impressed by your talking. You're running and chattering off at the mouth. It's not going to impress nobody. God has circumscribed our ministry with change. Whoever you are, if you're going to do something from God, you're going to have some change. Anybody that want nobody to talk about you, you're going to be in trouble. Somebody going to talk about you. Oh, I wish I had somebody pray with me. No, 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 no. No, no, just, just leave me. Somebody going to say something. You don't want nobody to do anything against you, you in trouble. You think you're going to go through here with a spotless record, having never deviated to the right or the left, never made a mistake. You in problem. Folk is going to bring up every mistake you ever made. See how Franklin is right. You can live for save and live for God for 45 years and make one mistake in the 46 years and people will forget 45 years of good work and talk about one night when you let the Lord down. Your ministry is always going to be in chain. People will always drag up your past. They'll never let people forget what once happened. We have a once upon a time mentality. And I don't care what you do, you're still in chain. There's a pragmatic answer, a pragmatic mind that's, that's, that's cynical, filled with unbelief. And say, you talking much, but preacher, you in chain. And Paul had to remember that I don't care what he did, God had him in chain. But yet it was not the chain of man, it was the chain of God. Paul began to master and realize that God had him in chain. Like that young man who was delivered from the demon possession. He wanted to run away with Jesus and preach to folk who didn't know nothing about his past. But Jesus told him to go back home. You've got to live down your past. I don't care who you are. You can't run away from what you did. You can't run away from your mistakes. You can't run away from your problem. You got to go right back where you made your mistake. Right back to the same folk you cussed out. Right back to the same people you mistreated. You got to go back to the same folk that you did wrong. The folk that you lied to. The folk that you broke their confidence in you. And you did them all kind of way bad. You can't run from them. You got to go back to them same folks. And through time and patience and perseverance show them the good things that God have Paul began to live it down he began to live it down one by one they chained a soldier to him and that soldier had to observe him and in the observation of Paul the servants became the soldier became convinced that this man is for real that's the great thing about our change our changes are not only an adversity but changes are an ally Sometimes the Lord change you to a situation so the folk that don't believe you can't get away. You can take your time and prove to them that Jesus is real and righteousness is right. I wish I had something. I ain't getting no amen from this because y'all ain't living that high. Amen. Amen. Paul was a prisoner of the Lord. And the Roman blacksmith that clinched the rivets and forged their links was not the hand of Rome, but it was the hand of an unseen presence that superintended the work. I'm talking to some Christian right now who's complaining and fatiguing under the load of his chain, who's angry at God for forging the links and saying that heaven have done you wrong, but heaven understands you and heaven understands your predicament and you are right where God wants you to be. You might feel like you can live a better witness somewhere else, but God has you right where he wants you to be. So live it where you at. Let your light so shine. I know you wish your husband was saved, but since he isn't saved, it's a good way to let the light shine. He's so dark that if you any kind of light at all, you ought to show up. You see, if you get the room dark enough, if it don't take a bright light. Most any kind of light at all is better. Well, my environment is so bad. That's why you don't you see you don't have to be real safe in that environment. Just any kind of salvation at all ought to put a little light on. Well, I don't hear nobody talking. Oh, I'm gonna take off here. I, I've got another idea I've got to give you. 
Paul said, and not only things that happened to me then, but there are things happening to me now. Without a fighting, but within our fears. God, I need someone to help me. God, I need someone to help me. Lord, I need some folk to help me. Amen. Without our fighting. Paul had no bed of roses in Rome. There was a minority that furnished a lot of thorns for his bed. They were provoking Paul. And they sought to profane the greatest thing that Paul held dear. They fought to profane the pulpit. Paul found enemies seeking to preach Christ. And they did it for all the wrong reasons. Some did it of envy and others of strife. Pitiful motives for Christian zeal. Envy is a powerful motive. Somebody was mad at Paul's success. And nothing is more discouraging than to look up and see folk going to work for God because they're mad at your progress. I don't hear nobody. Else. A whole lot of preaching is for envy. And looking around and trying to see who else is coming up. And who else is coming along and about to sin the sin of Joseph's brethren. They were born first, but God called who he wanted to call. God didn't anoint, God didn't anoint those eleven brothers, he anointed the youngest brother. And he said, the, the older shall serve the younger. Hello, somebody. God called who he want to call. He used who he want to call. He ain't got to call the first one. Sometimes the last shall be first. When the first shall be last. There was a brother there that was preaching because he was jealous. And a whole lot of the things that go on are motivated by jealous. Jealousy, a whole lot of women. Amen. They operate on jealousy. Hello, somebody. Only time they're interested in showing their husband some affection when they think some other woman is going to get him. Only time they get interested in old, old brother John Thumb is when they see some other sister looking at him. And if they never got jealous, they never would have known he was alive at all. It's bad when your whole work is motivated to keep somebody else out. It's bad when your whole motivation is to block and thwart and hinder somebody else. You ought to operate out of luck. And then there's another fellow who's worse than that. There's a fellow who was motivated by strife. Some people love confusion. Some people like a fuss. Some people love argument. Some people love a debate. Some folks, the only reason why they come to Sunday school is to get a fuss started. Some people, only why they, the only reason why they study scripture is to go to work and start a whole lot of confusion. The Bible is not to be debated. The Bible is to be believed. You don't get nobody save arguing. You don't get nobody saved proving you right. Only way you get saved by the saved is living it. You got to chain yourself to somebody and prove to them that the love of Jesus is right. Yeah. Well, I don't hear nobody. There's another fellow in there. He was motivated not by envy or strife, but he was motivated by rivalry. He had a party spirit. We got a lot of folks that from, would rather promote your belief, your system of thought. Would more would rather promote what you think is right than promote Jesus. But Christ is not what we think. Christ is what He is, and we are not promoting what our feelings and what our what what our point of view. But we ought to be promoting Jesus. You ought to preach the whole world. You ought to promote Christ in every facet in every dimension. You ought to preach the whole Bible. I don't hear nobody. Some people spend all their time hopping on sanctification and forget not only is God a holy God, but God's a God of love. That's why you can't pray for me after watching this right. You too selfish and you're motivated. You try to make like God is only your God. He only tends your church. He only belongs to your club. He agrees with you. And if I don't agree with you, God ain't with me. But Jesus said that when you pray, you got to include me. I know you put me out. I know you don't like me. I know you don't have nothing to do with me. But when you pray, you can't talk to him until you include me. He's our father. When you pray, you got to say, give us. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You got to say, lead us. You got to say, deliver us. And forgive us. You can't pray for yourself till you include me. He's a universal God. You got to quit hopping on one facet and let the people go to God for themselves. God don't belong to you. God belongs to everybody. 
We got too much partyism in the church. Folk running around talking about church of God and Christ. Church of God and Christ. God is not church of God and Christ. God is God. God is bigger than the church of God and Christ. He's bigger than the Baptist, bigger than the Methodist, bigger than the Apostolics, bigger than Jehovah's Witness, bigger than the Catholics, the Presbyterian, the Episcopalian. He's bigger than any of us can invent. God is all, all by himself, and we want to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, but having the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Ain't nobody hearing me today. Paul said there was a group that was making matters worse. They thought that by preaching that they would make trouble for him. It's bad to have a fellow in the church that want to keep up the devil, want to keep up a fuss because it makes the minister miserable. You got a group in church that only come to church to keep confusion because they think it might discourage the leader. But I want you to know that the leader is not disturbed. Paul said that I'm glad that for every reason and for every cause, Christ is preached. Some fellows ought not never even mention him, but I'm glad he's preached. Whether by pretense or in truth, I'm glad that by any means and all means and every means, Christ is preached. I don't hear nobody talking. I don't hear nobody talking. I'm about to come home now. I'm about to come home now. Paul began to look out and say, brethren, these things that happened to me have not been a furtherance, have not been a hindrance, but have been a furtherance. The gospel is in better shape now than it's ever been in my life. But I want you to know one other thing, brethren, that there is a group in the church that have become timid and insipid, that have lost their distinctiveness that made them real. But they've seen me in my chains and they've taken courage. That's why we need to live right. We need to live right because our life is a source of encouragement to someone who's looking on. Paul said the brethren wax confident because I went through so much, the Lord let someone else see that maybe their situation is not quite so bad. I come out here today to encourage somebody, to let somebody know to hold on, that the same God that's standing by my side will stand by your side. The same God that fight my battles will fight your battle. Saints, don't you know our lives ought to be a testimony of the goodness of the Lord? Uh, you ain't shouting today, but I know I'm preaching good. It's a high message. You got to be saved to understand it. That's why I can't preach most of this stuff, because most of y'all ain't saved good enough. I need to just preach dry bones. Little old elementary, let's, let's get saved sermons. I can't preach nothing great, because you ain't up to that level yet. No, Carlos, you ain't up to that level. You, you need to get right. Amen. I'm trying to encourage somebody to hold on. You about to give up right when God's about to do something. You around here complaining about, about your difficulty and your adversity. That chain was made by God. You looking at the man on the other end, but at the other end of your chain, your chain don't stop down here on earth. Your chain goes all the way up to heaven. And at the other end of that chain, God's holding that chain. And you ain't going to get free ever. You ain't going to never be free. If God did de de deliver you out of this, he's going to keep you chained. He's going to put you in something else. And when he gets you out of that, he's going to put you in something else. You're going to be chained till you get to heaven. Because you are not a prisoner of man. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Well, if you all jump on your feet and say, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. <laughs> Talking about these babies. When these babies get, get grown, you're going to still have a test. I know the twins are driving you crazy, but when the twins get grown, the Lord going to give you something else. The Lord let you deal with these twins so, so you can help some other mother that's going nuts by her quadruplets. She got quintuplets and she don't know what to do. You say, listen here, honey, the, I, I had twins and they drove me crazy, but the Lord carried me through. And if God carried me through, honey, he'll carry you through too. Be not dismayed, whatever be tired. God will. Touch your neighbor and say, he'll take care of you. Yeah. Woo, he'll take care of you. That was Paul's great assurance that these chains are made by Paul. We all have handicaps. We all have limitations. And try as we will, we can't escape it. I don't care where you go or what you, you do. You're not going to get away from it. There's a limitation. 
All of us are limitations. And you know what? Old age is one of the greatest limitations in the world. When you think you get smart, then you start going back and regressing. When you get at your best, then senility sets in. And you go back to your childhood. That's why you got to be sweet in your spirit. You can't be boisterous because the more boisterous you get, the, 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 the more weirder you act. The same way being in the chain. When the chain's on you, you just got to humble yourself and accept what God's putting on you. You can't be no different. God has set you within limits now. You are canary in a cage. And you hear canary singing. They are not singing because of the thing. They're singing in spite of it. They ain't letting you know that I don't care. You can cage me up. You can lock me away. You can take me out of my tree. You can take away my liberty and I ought not have no song. But deeply bred into my nature is the ability to sing. And I don't care how you chain me. I'm going to sing anyhow. And he gets up in the morning. You discourage and you'll listen to that bird singing in that cage and you'll realize why should I feel this courage and why should these shadows fall why should my heart grow lonely and long for my heavenly home when Jesus is my portion a constant friend is he his eyes his eyes his own the sparrow my heavenly father what chest the me. I trust in God I know he cares for me he cares for me on mountain bleak on the stormy sea or on the stormy sea billows rub he keeps my soul he keeps my soul come on let's do it my, my heavenly father Encourage my beloved. I get so sick of people jumping up reporting victory. I know all these folk bragging ain't, ain't, ain't victorious. And sometimes you can hear all these wild testimonies and feel like your life in Christ ain't much or nothing. You can't get up and report so much victory over this, that, and other. You can't report no supernatural deliverance, no supernatural healing, no great miracles work through you. I don't hear nobody. There was a time in my life when I could brag about never making mistakes, I thought. And the Lord let me succumb to the depths of degradation. I failed God in so many ways. And in shame, I thought God would reject me. But when I had failed God, God never failed me. When I stood unworthy to be a recipient of his love and grace, it's when his love was manifested most brightly unto me, when I felt I least deserved it, is when he gave me the greatest claim upon it. And when I weakest, is when I was strongest. Yes, he picked me up. I don't know why he did it. I don't know what made him. I don't know what he saw. I was so full of shame and loathing for my own self. I looked in the mirror and I hung my head and wondered if I would ever go to church again. But he picked me up. I'd fallen so low. Wondered if I ever could get straightened out again. But Jesus picked me up. The folk rock talked about me and hung my name out there in the wind. Scattered lies on me from coast to coast. Talked about me all over town. And they're still talking. But I'm not discouraged. For their talking have not been a hindrance. The Lord have taken their talk and furthered my gospel. He anointed me even more. He gave me a more powerful message. He gave me a greater hold on eternal life. And he stands up in me. How did 
Hallelujah. He picks me up. And when I'm weak, he picks me up. Ain't nobody talking. Yes, I'm in change. There's a great indignity. There's a great unbelievability that goes with that. I'm talked about. When I was broke, they talked about me for being broke. How can a man preach like I preach and ain't got nothing? How can he preach like this? I don't need you. I just need you to say amen. Just listen to me. I know where I'm at. You don't think you can live. You, you live say broke. Folk gonna run you down. You go on with, with, with the broke way. I'm going with the blessed way. When I was walking, they were saying, how in the world can a man preach like that and the Lord ain't blessing him? Must not be living right. He ought to practice what he preached. Must not have no faith. How come God ain't on his side? He's blessing all of us. How come he ain't blessing him? He's such a wonder. And when you go forward in God, you got to have some, you got to have some background. You can't be out here representing the king impoverished. The king is rich, you ought to have something. If God owned the cattle, you ought to eat a hamburger. Well, I don't hear nobody. I didn't have nowhere to stay, staying in the basement. Couldn't afford to pay no rent, driving a borrowed car, and folk ran me down. Stood out in front of the church, they pull up in their long Cadillacs. Let the power windows down, lean over and say, Preacher, you need a ride. Wind whipping around my wife, little old baby. Below zero weather. They didn't offer me no ride. They wanted to humiliate me. Heaping indignity upon me. The preacher needs a ride. Now the Lord doesn't put me to ride. I want to. I can put one foot in one Mercedes and put the other foot in the BMW. Lean back in the suburban. Me and brother, we can go up there to Rice Lake and catch fish in my bass boat. Cause the folk gonna talk, give them something good to talk about. Let them talk about how the Lord done blessed you. Yes, I'm chained. When I didn't have nothing, I was chained to having nothing. Folk looked at me and had a whole lot to say about that. Now the Lord doesn't bless me. They're trying to say I'm stealing. Now you know a man got the lie to sell a boat and stealing because I don't count the money. Don't know what happened to it. They got to tell me every week how much came in. I don't bank it. Somebody looking at me funny. Touch the neighbor and say, I don't care what you do. You're going to be in chain. I'm making the lesson clear. I know what I'm preaching. I'm preaching a powerful. You talk about a magnificent lesson. It's a magnificent lesson. Don't talk to nobody. They say you mean. Stuck up. Woman told me I was a sissy. Funny. Because I didn't want her. Yeah, we've been saying all over our church, you must be funny. Then when, you, then when you be friendly, then you're a whole month. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't care what you do, you're going you to be in a chain. You can't be nice, then you're fresh. Why don't y'all say amen? I'm trying to talk about what happened to you when you, when you get, in the, we get, get to working for the law. It's impossible to work for God without putting, God going to put chains on you. And you just got to make up your mind, I'm going to do the right thing. I don't care what folks say. Yeah. Amen. 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 Folks get up and say, well, you know, a preacher, he just down there taking all the folks' money. So I come to church and give $500 every week. You think that changed anybody's mind? Nope, I'm still in chain. Somebody over there talking about that's the big shot church. Now you know most of us is one step removed away from welfare. You know if this, this is definitely not no big shot church. Touch your neighbor and say, we just blessed, that's all.
But if you think I'm going back to pinto beans and fat back just to, just to prove to you I got a common touch, I got news for you. I can serve God with a pork chop. Don't tell me nothing about welfare. I know all about welfare. I spend most of my life on welfare. I ain't got nobody. Now, y'all easing out of here. Leave y'all tithes and offering at the door. The offering today is $45, and the, and the tithes as much as you can get. Yeah, they understand me. And you need to laugh sometimes. Laughter does the heart good. I want you to understand. And listen, now, Paul was there, and he couldn't preach. He shamed everybody. And behind his back, here come all these fellas in, tearing up the church, telling the folk that everything he said wasn't right. And then these fellas preaching for these impure motives. Paul had reason to think God was terrible. I know what to preach and should preach, and you won't let me preach. And the fellas that ain't got nothing to say or saying the wrong thing, you give them all opportunity to preach. Many of us are sitting on the church with sour grapes in our mouths, griping at heaven. You feel like you can do the job so much better than everybody else and the Lord won't let you do it. And the one that is doing it, he messed the thing all up. But you ought to quit griping about what somebody else is doing. Thank God for what he's allowing you to do. How am I doing here? Paul said, it's not been a hindrance, it's been a furtherance. Touch a neighbor and say, my change haven't hindered me. My change is making me better. I tried to deal with Joanne about her chain. She crying, fall out, argued at me, did everything but cut me out of her. And when somebody tries to deal with you about your chain, you don't enjoy it. You don't appreciate the preacher getting straight with you and telling you about your chain. You don't want them. But you got to remember, God makes up your chain. And he's going to keep you in your, your chain. You ain't going to never get out of the chain. Touch the neighbor and say, you ain't going to never get out of the chain. The Lord keeps you in the chain so he can be in control. I'm tired of you being in control. He want to be in control. I wish everybody wouldn't get on my nerve, but I got some members in my church. The Lord left here just to get on my nerve. Every time I preach real good, the Lord sent all them nerves, folks, right up here and take me down. And if you just sit around at the church for about 20 minutes, all of you hear something go, Psst. That's the Lord letting all the air out of my inner tube. I didn't preach the good sermon and, and I'm stepping on the cloud. But in 20 minutes, them members done, done they done said so much stuff and I'm holding my back, just easing toward the office. If I can just get out these clothes and get on. And I don't care what you do, somebody ain't gonna see you right. You do your best and people are not going to appreciate it. Hey. Lean over at your neighbor and say, quit living for other folk. Living for other folk. Let's please the Lord. Please. please the Lord. Paul didn't spend his time living what people's estimation. Paul forgot about the folk he was chained to. I preached a sermon sometime and I talked about how Paul Paul say, well, since you chained to me, I'm going to fix you. Yeah. I feel like praying. Yeah. He, get his old body down on his knees. Yeah. By his head. Yeah. And that man didn't know nothing about prayer. But Paul would pray until he looked around. And the man that didn't know nothing about prayer had his head bowed. Yeah. Saints, I want you to know that you have the power in you to transform every situation that God allowed you to go in. Yeah. You just live it. Quit arguing about what God put you in and just live it. Quit arguing about how difficult it seemed and just live it. And if you live it, God will change things. I'm going to let you go. Somebody here has a chain. It's heavy and burdensome. It's humiliating. It's embarrassing. But our lives are lived in change. You tell the Lord, Lord, I thank you for my chain. You got to come to peace with your chain. You got to learn, the Paul said, I'll learn how to glory in my chain. I'm the prisoner of the Lord Jesus. Y'all ain't saying nothing. 
Some of y'all bouncing around and the word is coming to you to help you today. You ought to be sitting here gobbling up this word. Your life is all messed up now because you won't hear the word. Yes, you got some change. What you doing with your change? Look at your neighbor and say, what are you doing with your change? Who been blessed by your change? Paul said, I boast of Onesimus who was begotten through my chain. Some folk won't get saved until you get put in chain. Touch your neighbor and say, you might be bound, might be bound. but the word of God is not bound. <laughs> Isn't that rich? Isn't that rich? Paul said, yes, I'm chained, but the word I preach, it ain't chained. Yeah. Raise your hand at, at the Lord and say, Lord, don't let the life I live. Lord, ever be chained but let it be free to accomplish your will how many don't mind what you're going through as long as God's being pleased and is accomplishing God's will I got some folk here that's trying to told me well I'm going to leave Flint you leave Flint you're going to nothing you're going to the dogs you're going to die right away why because Flint had the gospel here you got a pastor that's concerned about you, caring for you. Except you abide in the ship, you will not be saved. I told Papa one day I was going to leave. He said, boy, you going to come to nothing. He said, you better stay with me. The Lord put you with me. You didn't get delivered on your own. You got delivered through me, boy. You better stay with me. You just stiff it out, tough it out. He said, it seemed rough, but you stay there. The Lord have a purpose for it. And you tough it out, after a while you see the reason why it got you there. And I'm glad I toughed it out. It really wasn't so tough anyway. I need to humble myself anyway. Touch your neighbor and say, your change is meant to humble you. You too proud anyway. Can't nobody tell you nothing. And all you folk, can't nobody tell you nothing. You just get enough change on you. Somebody better tell you something. Don't care how bad you are, put you in solitary confinement long enough. You come out there obeying orders. Don't nobody tell me where to stand. They put you in solitary confinement long enough. They tell you stand, yes, I'll stand right here. Oh, bad, a lot of old bad prisoners be in there. They put them in that solitary long enough. When, when they finally get out of there, they, they be just as humble and sweet. Touch your neighbor and say, God can straighten everybody out. Some of us is too bad for our wives. Our kids can't tell us nothing. Can't nobody on the job handle us. But I want you to know God can handle you. God can put you in some confinements to straighten your attitude right out. Amen. Why? Because the Lord had to straighten me out. I got so big and bad that couldn't nobody handle me. So the Lord chained me. And when he got done to me, I said, yes, Lord. Touch your neighbor and say, you don't come out of them until you say yes. The change is made to make you say yes. Y'all don't know, but I'm helping now. Now you wonder why the Lord put these old bad workers with you. God got them there for you. You run over everybody else. Got you somebody that won't, won't get your stock out. They ain't going to do right. Now what you going to do? Now what you going to do? I'm going to pink slip him. You can't pink slip the whole apartment. You, you have to change your attitude. You have to find out that you got to go along to get along. Dogging everybody out. You have to learn if you be nice to folk, folk will be nice to you. Y'all don't like me teaching. I'm teaching good. You can be old Hitler walking around with all your authority and power. Sending folk home for three and four days. But sooner or later, the Lord put you in a cramp where you got to humble right down. And learn how to be a nice guy. I'm going to tell you this story and I'm closing. There's a sign in the neighborhood. And I go by this house every day. It burdens me. And fills me with grief. There's a beautiful house, but it's fenced in. And when you walk by this house, this house is littered with bottles and bricks and sticks. And all kinds of objects. And in front of this house is a sign saying, Bad Dog. Yes. You see, there's a bad fella that lives at this house. Yes. He's a bad dog. Yes. And people that don't even know him pick up a rock. And every time they see it, they throw it at him. Yes. 
people he never even bought go out of their way to show him spite. You know why? They hung a sign around his neck called Bad Dog. It's bad to go through life with a sign around your neck. Bad dog. You getting kicked and mistreated when you haven't done nothing to nobody. But you in your spirit have got so arrogant, so unadmonishable. Can't nobody talk to you. You just a bad dog. There's a dog in the house right next door. Ain't no fence. Yard is clean. And the dog come down, everybody pat him. But the one right next door, he's always got a brick. He running behind, trying to hide. You know why? And instead of getting sweeter, he gets meaner. He's not set free now. He's got to be chained day and night. Because he let the bricks of this life make him worse. Instead of make him better. He's a bad dog. You can't make it in this world with a bad attitude. Your altitude depends on your attitude. You need the Lord to give you a meek and a quiet and a sweet spirit. Because the same hand that pricks up a brick to throw can also pat you on the head. Give you a bone, feed you. Some people make it in life where everybody's nice to them. But if you want friends, you got to first show yourself to be friendly. Touch a neighbor say, be careful what you say or do. What you send out comes right on back to you. If you treat people right, people will treat you right. What is my job, preacher? Your job is to let the sweet love of Jesus shine through. All of my theology is crystallized and condensed into my ability to let people see the love of God. Sometimes it's just going next door. Sometimes it's picking somebody up and carrying them to the, to the shopping center. Sometimes it's spending time with somebody. But when you get done dancing and speaking in tongues and revelation, you still got to show people the love of God. Let your light so shine among men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Touch your neighbor and say, remember my chains. All you folk that got it made on flower beds of ease, all of us don't have it made. Some of us are going through some. Some of us have been stigmatized for this gospel and we're bad with shame and reproach. But I'm encouraged to walk with Jesus. Yes, I am. Bow your head where you are, Father God. We thank you for your day. We thank you for this gracious message to us. For it's a gospel of chains. All of us is bound with something. But somehow, Lord, let us be free. For the word of the Lord is not bound. Keep us in the midst of the strife. And keep us from the evil. Don't let us be tainted and become sour and embittered by the things that happen to us in life. I don't want a prune spirit. I don't want a raisin spirit. But I want a grape that gives forth wine. I don't want to become bitter, Lord. But Lord, I want you to preserve me. If you preserve me, you're going to have to pull me down or pick me up. You're going to have to peel me and cut me open. And you're going to have to cut away the good from the bad. But what's left is going to be worth preserving. But I'm not preserved yet. You're going to have to put a fire under me and put the sugar over me. And when the fire under me draw the sugar in me, then I'll be preserved. I want to be preserved, Lord. It's something about preserves. The longer you keep them, the sweeter they get. I've had some preserves that my grandmother made, and I opened them up, and they had turned to solid sugar. It's something about a saint that ought to mean sweetness. The longer I be with Jesus, the sweeter I ought to become. Preserve me. <laughs> oh, my God. We need some preserves here, Lord. This world needs preserves. We got too many sour lemons. 
We got too many dried raisins. We got too many wrinkled prunes. The world is looking for preserves. Not canned, not pickled, but preserved. Blameless unto the coming of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, thank God. Then. Amen. I've had prayer with you. I've talked to you. What more can be done?